Well, good morning. If you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, beginning in verse 12. Last week it was pointed out to me that um, rather atypical of preachers and that I tend to be more enthusiastic in the middle of the sermon than at the end of the sermon, whereas most preachers get much more passionate at the end. And I thought about that for a while, and it's definitely true, but I think I have a pretty good reason for it. Uh, most preachers get really excited at the end because that's when they start telling you what you need to do. It's the application comes at the end. And that's what gets most people all worked up. Whereas in the middle, at least when I'm preaching, that's when we start talking about the work of Christ what he has done and the work that Christ has done seems so much tremendously more significant than the work we would do. You know, he secures our salvation. He accomplishes our redemption. He defeats the power of death and, and sin and we respond to that salvation. But but his you know, Jesus is the hero of the story. It's not me and it's not you. So it, to me it seems right to be more excited when we're talking about what Jesus has done than about what we need to do. And with that mindset firmly in mind, I come to John chapter 14, verse 12, and we have something that seems like it just completely throws that on its head. And this is what Jesus says, and John writes, John 14, 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So, Jesus directly, plainly states that we are not only going to do the same works that he's doing, but greater works. Do a greater work than Jesus. And that has a, a very difficult, troubling hard to understand impact on, on me. But I think we can understand this. I think we can understand this and still see Jesus as ultimately the hero of our salvation. Before we begin to talk about it, let's pray and ask the Lord to assist our understanding. Father, we are a weak and lowly people. You are beyond us. Your ways are beyond us. We can't grasp all of who you are and all of what you've done. But we rejoice to know that you love us, that you loved us enough to send your Son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Lord, help us to understand what you have revealed to us and help us to be content with that revelation and seek nothing further. Lord, as, as we have friends and brothers and, and sisters away from us this morning as, as they travel for Thanksgiving, Lord, we ask that as they gather saints in other cities, you would bless them as well, Lord, that, that in every place where your word is faithfully proclaimed, that it would go forth with power. 
that it would accomplish its purpose. That you would be glorified. That your people be edified. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, here in John chapter 14, again, we have a very plain statement that whoever believes in Jesus will do the same works that Jesus does and greater works. And you can't just say that, well, if you look at the Greek, you see that greater really, no, it, it means greater, larger, more impressive, more important, more significant. There is a greater work done. Before we get to what that work is, though, we need to see who Jesus is talking about. Jesus doesn't say that, you know, ten years after I die, someone will believe in me and he'll do a greater work, and Paul will become an apostle and establish the church throughout the Roman Empire and write half of the New Testament. It doesn't say 300 years later, a man named Augustine or Augustine will come along and be born in, in the town of Hippo and will establish the theology and, and doctrine and understanding of the church for the next millennium. It doesn't say that 1,500 years later, a German monk named Martin Luther will recover the gospel that had been subverted and perverted by the Roman Catholic Church and begin the Protestant Reformation. He didn't say 1,700 years later, George Whitfield would stride across two continents, one continent and an island, America and England, preaching the gospel to tens and hundreds of thousands of people. He didn't say that 2,000 years later, a man named Billy Graham would hold crusades with tens of thousands of people coming forward and making professions of, of faith. He, he doesn't say that there's going to be these particular great individuals who are going to come and do a greater work. He says, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do. It's not just that there are going to be some great Christians doing great things to advance the work of Jesus Christ. It's everyone who believes in him. It's not just Billy Graham, it's not John MacArthur or John Piper or whomever you care to name. If you believe in Jesus, this is talking about you. You are called to do the same work and a greater work than Jesus. So we have we have to understand what is this work because quite clearly none of us are hosting crusades that have tens of thousands of people coming to them every night nobody's doing that anymore what is this greater work we need to understand it's the same work that Jesus did and, and does we think, what, well, what did Jesus do? He, he came into the world. He healed the sick. He cast out demons. He fed thousands. He taught. But ultimately, he proclaimed the gospel. And it's interesting, as we read the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's almost always not just called the gospel. It's called the gospel of the kingdom of God. Jesus came into the world proclaiming the kingdom of God, and he went about establishing the kingdom of God. And, and that, I submit to you, is the overarching great work of Jesus Christ, is declaring and establishing the kingdom of God. The healings were a part of establishing the kingdom of God. The teaching was a part of establishing the kingdom of God. Raising the dead was a part of establishing the kingdom of God. When we look at Matthew 3, 2, 
or Mark 1.15. We have these summary statements of Jesus' ministry. And I'm, I'm very fond of quoting, I mean, especially Mark 1.15. You know, the, the command from Jesus was repent and believe in the gospel. But what leads up to that in his teaching is Jesus went proclaiming the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. It, it, it wasn't, here's an opportunity for you to escape the wrath of God, repent and believe in the gospel. It, it's not, you know, I've come into the world as, as the savior of the world, repent and believe in the gospel. It's the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. When he sent out his disciples, Matthew 10, 7, he sent them out to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. gospel of the kingdom. In, in Matthew 6, 33, he urges the people not to seek first the salvation of your soul, not to, to seek the grace of God through Jesus Christ. He said, seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Matthew 12, 28, when Jesus is challenged about casting out demons, and, and the naysayers say, well, it's by the prince of demons that he casts out demons. And Jesus explains that it's impossible for Satan to cast out Satan. Satan's kingdom is not divided against itself. He says, but if this work is done by the power of God, then the kingdom of God has come among you. The, the promise that Jesus made in, in Mark 8 that many people take to, to mean that well, John, the, the beloved, must still be alive today. As he says, I tell you, truly, there are people standing here today who will not taste death until they see not, not until they see the resurrected Son, not until they see the forgiveness of sins, until they see the kingdom of God come in power. Jesus' ministry is about the kingdom of God. The prayer that he taught his disciples is, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The book of, of Revelation we, we see these repeated claims that the end of all things, what, what's really happening is the kingdom of God overtaking the kingdom of this world. Um, Revelation 5, I'm sorry, Revelation 11, 15, it's quoted in, in Handel's Messiah. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That's what Jesus' work is about, is about bringing his kingdom into this world. We are called out the domain of darkness into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. Through, through being born again, get John 3, when Jesus talks to Nicodemus, he, he doesn't tell him that unless you're born again, you can't be saved doesn't say, unless you're born again, you, you can't join the church. He says, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless you're born of water and spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. It, it's all about the kingdom of God, the place where God's will is perfectly done. Where everything is in complete, perfect conformity to his will. Where there is no sin, there is no sickness, there is no sadness. God reigns as king over all, and everything is perfect. That's what Jesus was bringing into the world through his work, through his power. The parables that he taught, almost all of them begin, the kingdom of God can be compared to, it's, it's all about the kingdom of God. And the gospel is about us entering into the kingdom of God, because we're all born under the power of Satan. 
We're not in God's kingdom. We're in the enemy kingdom. But through the gospel, God puts us to death in this kingdom. He raises us to life in the heavenly kingdom. It's how Paul can write in Philippians that our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a savior. It's how Peter can write that we've been made a kingdom of priests. We are in God's kingdom now. He is our king and our father. And we are his, his children and his servants. And we live to do the father's will. And we rejoice in the father's will. Jesus' work is the kingdom of God. It has already begun. It is growing in this world. And it will come into its fullness when Jesus comes again. That is the work that Jesus does. And that's the work that we are called to do. Jesus has already inaugurated the kingdom. But he's left us here to expand that kingdom in the world, to advance it throughout the world, until he comes again to receive his kingdom. We advance the kingdom of God when we do his will, when we conform ourselves to his will, when we put to death the sin that dwells in us, and when we proclaim the gospel of the kingdom, when we call others out of darkness into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. And we have to do this work because in the end of verse 12, Jesus says that Greater works than these he will do because I am going to the Father. Jesus Christ is, is no longer living in this world. He is at the Father's side. He's left us as his ambassadors, as his representatives in the world to further his kingdom. So he comes again. We are, we are his ambassadors. We are his messengers, his representatives. He's charged us to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all that he has commanded us and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's commanded us to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost ends of the earth. You are a part of that kingdom today because someone was faithful to that commission and proclaimed the gospel to you. Many of us read just a few weeks ago, finished, hopefully, or almost finished, or almost started, the book uh, Redemption Accomplished and Applied by John Murray. And we, we talked a lot when, when Dennis Gunderson was here about the accomplishment of that redemption. We, we really didn't talk about the application of that redemption. And even in, in John Murray's book, I think it's, it's wonderful, he, he talks about how the Holy Spirit applies that redemption. He talks about effectual calling and, and conversion and union with Christ and, and what God does to apply that redemption to us. But God works to apply that redemption to us through his people. Paul writes, the book of Romans. How are they to believe? Which says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How are they to call on him with whom they've never on him? how are they to call on him in whom they do not believe? How are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And if anybody in the entire world, in the history of the world, could ever have made an argument that People don't need to go preach the gospel because God will save them anyway. Be the Apostle Paul. So we know how Paul was converted. He was on the road to Damascus with letters from the Jewish officials ready to seize and imprison any Christians he found there. 
when God knocked him off his horse and said, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? God does not often work that way. God works through his people. He applies redemption by the Spirit through his people. And in future weeks, we'll look more at the Holy Spirit living in Christians and working through them. God does the work of salvation. He applies his redemption to you. He brings you into his kingdom, but he does the work through his church. He works through you, and you do this greater work by the Holy Spirit who dwells inside of you. You have to do the work. You and I, the church, has the commission to spread the kingdom of God through proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the greater work. It, it's not performing miracles. It's not about healing people. God can, can heal, but that's not the important thing. Because we still die. It's, it's, it's not about feeding vast crowds. It's, it's not about proclaiming to large multitudes of, of people. It's not about gathering huge crowds or having a huge church. It's about advancing the kingdom of God. Jesus inaugurated it. Jesus had, had the 12. He had another small group of disciples. And, and the greater work has been to spread the kingdom of God from that small group in the backwater of the Roman Empire to size it is today, and, and that great work is continuing to grow the church throughout time until Christ returns again. That is the greater work that we are called to do. It's what we must do. That's what we are here for. We're, we're not here to make money. We're not here to entertain ourselves. We're not here to advance the ideals of American democracy across the world. We're here to advance the kingdom of God. That's your, that is your calling in life. You might go about it in different ways, but that is what you are here for. So how do we go about it? Again, I, I, I just said, we all do this in different ways. The Bible talks repeatedly of the church being one body with many parts. And, and just like how it wouldn't work well to try playing soccer, standing on your hands, right, there, there are certain people who should be doing different things. Not everybody's called to do the exact same thing, but there is a, a common theme, a common thread that everybody is called to in the same way. And we, we need to make very clear, this is the work of the entire church. Um, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, Paul writes, Ephesians 4.11, Jesus gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. The purpose of the apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherds and teachers is not to do the work of ministry. It's to equip the saints to do the work of ministry. If, if we rely on one man or a few men, no matter how great they are, to do the work of ministry, to advance in the kingdom of God, it, it's not going to succeed. It's the work of the church. It's your work. So how, again, how, how do we do this? First thing we do 
is ask Jesus the word. In verses 12 and, I'm sorry, verses 13 and 14, John 14, John 14, verses 13 and 14. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So Jesus is just finished saying that if you believe in me, whoever believes in me will do a greater work than I'm doing. Then he says, whatever you ask in my name, I'll do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. All the, all the work that ever gets done, even though we work, we certainly work, but it's ultimately done by God. By the Father, by the Son, by the Holy Spirit. He gets all the glory and all the praise for it. And if you ever... If you ever read anything about any Christian hero that leaves you thinking, man, what a great person so-and-so was, whoever, whoever, whether Martin Luther, Charles Spurgeon... Elizabeth Elliot, whomever. If you believe, think, man, that, that was a great person, rather than thinking, wow, that's a great God, then, then either you've missed the point or the biographer didn't do a good job. The Holy Spirit lives within us. Paul can say, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. All the work that gets accomplished is the work of Jesus. You can't do anything on your own apart from Jesus. So don't try to do anything on your own apart from Jesus. Ask him and trust him to do it. He's promised twice in consecutive verses that whatever you ask, he will do it. He does it this way so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. He deserves all the credit, all the glory, all the praise for the work. Not you, not me. Jesus Christ deserves the glory. And the Father receives glory from the Son. If you ask Him anything in His name, He will do it. And this word, ask, sometimes reading Greek actually is, is helpful. Um, you guys know this, you speak Spanish. A lot of times, words in English and Spanish, even though you can translate them, the word doesn't mean exactly the same thing. As you, I mean, you can get really close, but you, know, you have a word that can mean, it's called a semantic range. You know, a different word can mean a couple different things. And the overlap's not always right there. This word, ask, there's a bunch of different words in Greek for ask. This isn't... This isn't making a, a polite request. It, it, it's not. It's not you know asking. A couple weeks ago, a middle school girl knocked on the door and asked me if I'd like to buy a pizza to support some fundraiser. I still got my pizza. I need to call them about that. Um, it, it's not. It's not making this polite request. And you can say yes. You can say no. You can. Make up your mind about it. This this ask here is it's more proper. It's more precisely demanding what you have a right to. Um, in English, the best example that came to me is if you get pulled over by a police officer and they ask you for your license and registration, you don't really get a choice to say no. I don't feel like showing you that today. Or, at the same time, if the police show up at your house and tell you they're coming in and you ask them for the search warrant, again, they can't say that, well, no, I don't have a search warrant, but I'm still coming in. It's, they have to have a search warrant to enter your house. Or you have to. You can still invite them without a search warrant. But if they don't have one, they don't have a right to be in your house. You have a right to see that search warrant. They have a right to see your driver's license if they pull you over while you're driving. It's... Yes, they're asking for it, but you don't really have a choice to say no. They have a right to what they're asking for. 
Here it's, it's the same thing. And there's, there's this great danger, again, in this word whatever, in verse 13, and in anything, verse 14. It, it's an indefinite pronoun, so that's an accurate way to, to translate it, but it's something being asked in Jesus' name. It's, it's not just ask for whatever you want in the world. You, you can't say, Jesus, I want a red Corvette and feel like Jesus is obligated to give it to you because you're asking in, in Jesus' name. Again, this really the, the only time we use this regularly, in, not even very regularly in American culture, but on TV shows, cop dramas, you know, stop in the name of the law. Police officers invoke the power of the law because the law, as it's written and approved by the government of the country, demands that you stop. It says that the police officers have a right to order you to stop, that you have an obligation to stop. As a substitute teacher, when I'm teaching, I'm, I'm teaching in the name of whomever I'm filling in for. I don't get to just decide, okay, well, you're not going to take this test today, even though you know, Mrs. Sheriff's left it for you. Um, she left plans. It's my responsibility to give you those plans. It, it's still, even though I'm the one giving it to the students, it's still from the teacher. It's under her authority. And 90% of the time when students are causing trouble in class, all I do is say that, you know, well, I'm leaving a note for whomever. It's their authority. They're going to deal with it when they come back. But even when I do discipline or grade or assign make assignments, it, it's all what the teacher left for me. It's in her name or his name. It's not my own power and authority. And this, we're not asking whatever we want. We're asking in Jesus' name. We are demanding what Jesus has instructed us to ask for. To pray for God's will to be done. To pray for laborers to go out into the harvest. To, to pray for the kingdom to be enlarged. We don't have a right to just ask for whatever we want. James 4.3 makes that very, very clear. James 4 begins, you know, why are there fights and quarrels among you? do not have because you do not ask. But he says you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Our prayers are in the name of Jesus. We're asking for things as representatives of Jesus. And, and all we can ask for is what Jesus wants us to ask for. Our prayers need to be centered around his kingdom the advance of his kingdom. And we can pray these prayers with, with boldness and confidence because we're asking Jesus to do what he has promised to do, what he commands us to do. We ask for it and he does it. And when we don't even know what to ask for, uh, Romans 8 tells us the Holy Spirit intercedes for us in our weakness. That so when we don't know what to pray, Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings too deep for words, interceding according to the mind of the Father. Prayer works. Prayer has power. And the first work of every Christian must be prayer. It must be prayer. We're asking Jesus to do what he has said he will do. It's not bending God to our will. It's submitting ourselves to God's will. And He will do it. It's Jesus, and only Jesus, who can bring our families, our siblings, our children to faith. It, it's only Jesus, that will convert our neighbors and our neighborhoods and our nation. 
can't do anything without Jesus. We, again, it, it's so hard to preach sections of this. Um, just next chapter in John, John 15, she says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. First work is prayer. But a second part of, of this work, we'll look at this at more length next week, but uh, John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You know, this isn't the start of a separate conversation from Jesus. This is this continuing the same conversation. You will do a greater work. Whatever you ask me, in my name, I will do it. The Father might be glorified in the Son. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. It, it, it's all right together. It's one conversation. We do the work Jesus has set for us by keeping his commandments. Christ is the head of the church. Next, next week, and we'll talk a whole lot more about why and how we keep these commandments, why we have to keep his commandments, how we can say that we have to keep the commandments without saying that we're saved by works. We'll, we'll look at all of that next week. For today, it's enough to say that to do the greater work we're called to, to advance the kingdom of God, in addition to asking Jesus to work, we have to keep his commandments. And so what are some of these commandments that we are called to do? The first one, again, the most obvious one, the most essential one, if you're not doing this, nothing else is going to matter, is, is prayer. Uh, 1 Timothy, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray without ceasing. You can't do this work on your own strength. God has to work. Pray without ceasing. But we can't just say, okay, well, I've prayed about it, and I don't have any further responsibilities. We have to keep the commandments. And, and, and the commandments, and the great overarching commandments, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love our neighbor as ourselves. And if you're doing that, you are, you are keeping the entirety of the law. But we don't know how to love as we ought. And so, as we read Scripture, we, we see what these commandments are. We have to read our Bibles. We have to know these commandments. We have to do them. It, it's like... If you're in the Navy, you're on your submarine in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and you receive a message from the Pentagon with your new orders, and you just never bother to actually read the message they sent you. You, you know it's there, and you just ignore it and, and do your thing. And then, you know, later, your seniors military hat. Well, why didn't you do what you were supposed to do? So, well, I never read the message. I never got the message. That's not going to be a valid excuse. Um, it, it got to you. You knew it was there. You just refused to read it. So many Christians, we know this is the Word of God. And we neglect it so much. And so I, like we think, well, if I don't read it, then I'm not responsible for it. You, you know it's there. Refusing to read it is not going to absolve you of your responsibility. If you're playing soccer, your coach is yelling instructions, and, and you don't like them, so you stick your fingers in your ears. And, okay, yeah, you can't hear the instructions anymore. That's not going to do you any good. You're still going to get in trouble for ignoring your coach. That's what we do so often. So if we have to read it, we have to do it. So here are some of the things, this nowhere near exhaustive 
but a few things that Scripture calls us to do that is important in carrying out the work God has left us left for us. In 1 Timothy 4 7, God says through Paul, train yourself for the purpose of godliness. Train yourself for the purpose of godliness. Right, everybody here has, has gone through training, whether it be for, for sports or medical care or the military. You, you've gone through training. You do a lot of training. If you play sports, you spend more time training than you do playing. At least we do. I'm assuming soccer players do as well. Um, in the military, you spend so much more time drilling for everything again and again and again and again than you ever actually do it in real life. Why, why do we train so much for these things? It's because when it happens in real life, and I'm talking about sports being real life, not, but when it happens for real, you don't get a chance to do it over again. If you mess up on the soccer field, it, you, you messed up. If you score on your own team, you, you can't, oh, let me do that over again. Even more so in, in the military. If you press the wrong button and you blow up your submarine, you can't just press the undo button and do it over again. Same thing with, with healthcare. When you need to make the right decision to save somebody's life, you need to get it right. And obviously, some of these things are much more important than other things depending on where you're from, will determine what you think is most important. I won't tell Colombians that soccer is not important. But I will tell you that so much more important than any of these things is the gospel of God. Because everything else is in this world only. It'll have an impact for, depending on what it is, I mean, if, if you're a soccer player and you, you win a major championship, you know, you, you might be happy for, I don't know, maybe even a couple months over winning this, this great championship. And then the next season starts, and it doesn't matter that you won last year. Um, you save a life, you make an impact for the next. 60 said however long of their life, but eventually they're going to die. Again, the kingdom of God is, is forever. We're dealing with matters of much greater significance, much longer lasting. This isn't a matter of winning or losing. It's not a matter of, of saving a life. It, it's, it's not a matter of saving a, a nation. This is a matter of saving souls for eternity. Train yourself for godliness. Quite literally, what you do as a Christian will determine eternity. Eternity is at stake. Eternal souls will either spend eternity in heaven or an eternity in hell. We're responsible for proclaiming the truth to them, for being trained to do it right, to do it well. Train yourself for godliness. Specifically in training ourselves for godliness, 2 Timothy 2, 15 says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. The, the major part of being trained for godliness is knowing, understanding, doing, applying the word of truth. God. Can you rightly handle the word of truth? And if you're not confident in your ability to handle the word of truth, if you're not growing in your ability to handle the word of truth, then you need to devote yourself to figuring out how to handle that word. 
you to read it. You need to read all of it. You need to understand and interpret scripture by scripture. You need to handle it rightly and handle it well. It's the word of truth. It's the word of life. If you don't know how to handle it and you don't know where to start handling it, then that's when you go and get help. That's that's what the elders of a church are for. It's equipping the saints. If you need help in rightly handling the word of truth, then let's work on that together. You have to write the end of the word of truth. You have to be competent with the word of truth. You need to know how to use it, how to explain it, how to apply it. And third thing, for absolutely everybody, Colossians 4, verses 5 and 6. Colossians 4, verses 5 through 6. Looking at Colossians helps more than looking at 1 Thessalonians 4. Colossians 4, verse 5 and 6. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. We so, so often fail in, in all of these things. We don't walk in wisdom towards outsiders. We don't make the best use of time, and our speech is not gracious. In social media makes this so much more obvious than it ever has been before. But in the aftermath of the election a few weeks ago, we've seen tremendously ungracious speech from both sides. We're commanded to always be Gracious, even when you are completely right, and the person who's complaining to you or ranting at you or arguing against you is completely wrong, you're not commanded to win your argument and, and just grind them into the dust. Always be gracious, be wise, let your speech be seasoned with salt, demonstrate showcase, display the love of the gospel in your speech, in your conduct, in your action. Make the best use of time. Your goal isn't it's to, to win arguments and make enemies. It's to make disciples. It's not to shut down conversations and, and shut people up. It's to show them the gospel and call them into the kingdom. And we, we live in a society that cultural world that makes it so very easy to waste time. really seems like our culture is handmade to waste time. We have cable television with thousands of channels with there's always something interesting on TV if you have enough channels. There's always something you can waste time doing. And if that's not good enough, then we have the internet with Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and YouTube, and you can watch cats doing funny things all day long. They're uploading, you know, faster than you can't watch everything on you. There's always more there. There's always something you can waste your time doing. But we're commanded to make the best use of time. We, we don't have an unlimited amount of time. We have only this one life. 
It won't last forever. And then we will enter into eternity. And it'll, it'll be glorious and it'll be great, but it'll be too late to do the work that we've been commanded to do here. We, we can't do it later. There's not an opportunity of conversion in the next life. We have to make the best use of our time here and now. We, we have to say no to lesser things, even, even if it's not bad things. I mean, I was up at Allison's parents' house, and um, saw a commercial. I think it's December 23rd is the start of a Mythbusters marathon that is going to be 11 straight days of 24 hours a day of Mythbusters. 260-something episodes just played consecutively. All right, there's nothing wrong with Mythbusters. All right, it, it's a great TV show. It, it's not you know, filthy and, and unclean. And, but it's so easy. You know, I, like, I have a desire somewhere within me that on December 23rd just buy Mythbusters and watch it for the next 11 days. That's a tremendous waste of time. Not that Mythbusters is bad, but there is something better. And it's obvious when it's for 11 straight days, but it happens to us in so many subtle ways as, as well. We give up so much of our lives and our energy to worthless things. I'm not saying you can ever rest and relax and, and be entertained. There's a place for rest and relaxation and recreation. But it, it must be done to restore our strength and energy and enthusiasm to, to work again for the kingdom of God. If we're not careful, it will destroy our lives. It's destroyed so many American lives. So many people do nothing beyond work, sleep, watch television. Say, say no to these lesser things that we might make a better use of our time. We need to remember that we're in a war. Um, 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5, Paul says that even though we walk in the flesh, we don't wage war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. Ready to take every thought captive to obedience to Christ. We are in a war. The, the, the whole world, 1 John, the whole world lies in the power of of the evil one. And God's kingdom is coming into this world. And Satan is not just going to say, okay, here you go. it's all yours. All right. Satan hates the Lord and he hates all of his people. And we're in a war. It's a spiritual war. It's not going to be solved with, with guns and, and explosions and bombs. done through prayer, through righteousness, and through the proclamation of the truth. We're, we're destroying arguments. We're not, we're not killing people. We're killing sin. But we are at war. We need to remember that. Um, one, of, one of the great complaints against Barack Obama during his presidency from conservatives was his, his refusal to ever say the words Islamic terrorists or Islamic terrorism. Um, not saying that all Muslims are terrorists, but there is an Islamic 
state that is seeking to destroy the country. And, and the argument was that you know by refusing to acknowledge this and refusing to say that we need to war against this, we're not doing anything about it. We're just letting them grow and, and gain in power. And so many Christians, same ones who are criticizing Barack Obama for not saying Islamic terrorism, will refuse to say that we're in a spiritual war, not against Muslims, not against atheists, not against any religion or any people or any country, but against Satan and his kingdom. We are at war. We need to wage this war by the power of the Spirit, the strength of his word, for the advance of God's kingdom and for the salvation of the lost. The kingdom of God is, is here, it's growing, it's coming, it will enter into its fullness. Nothing can stop that. But there's a world around us that's outside of that kingdom. And if they remain outside, those people are going to spend an eternity in hell. God commands us to go and proclaim the gospel to them. We need to be ready to do it. We need to pray for God's assistance. We need to pray for God's spirit to move. But we need to do the work. We need to proclaim the truth. We need to rightly handle the word of truth. So whatever... <coughs> Whatever you're doing tomorrow, whatever you're doing the rest of today, remember this work, remember this war that we're in. Don't ignore it, don't pretend it doesn't exist. But train yourself for the work and do the work. God commands you to do it. And eternity depends on it. Do the work. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for bringing your kingdom into the world. We thank you for calling us into it. We don't deserve it. We're by nature children of wrath. We're enemies of God. But you loved us and you sent your son to die for our sins, to reconcile us to you. Lord, we know that, that the world that continues outside your kingdom doesn't deserve your gospel, but you hold it out to them. You command us to go to them, to be your representatives, to implore them to be reconciled to Christ. Lord, we confess we have wasted so much time. We have consumed hours and days and months and years with lesser things. Lord, we ask that you would so work in us, stir up our, our hearts and our spirits to be devoted to your kingdom. To, to wage a holy war to proclaim the truth to devote ourselves to godliness to face the unfinished
task of proclaiming the gospel to the ends of the earth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.